Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us for THR Presents the Underground Railroad. It is great to have with us the showrunner and director, Barry Jenkins, the cinematographer, James Laxton, the editor, Joy McMillan, and the star, Tuso Mbedu. And we are uh, really thrilled that you made the time. And uh, I just want to thank you. I had the uh, treat of seeing this entire series over three days and actually on a big screen. And then I went back and watched uh, Chunks on, on the small screen as well. And it's just um, both places really uh, outstanding. And we'll talk about the, the you know, all of that. But Barry, I, I guess let's start at the beginning if we can. Um, I understand that the Underground Railroad, just the idea of it was something that intrigued you as even a kid. And then uh, you were aware of Colson Whitehead's book before, uh, you know, the rest of us even before it was out. Uh, so just what's what's at the root of your interest in uh, the Underground Railroad and, and particularly Coulson's work? Yeah, I had, um, you know, I, once I started making movies, I had always, I knew I always wanted to make something that dealt with uh, the story of my ancestors, that dealt with the story of um, the institution of American slavery. And, uh, and yeah, when I was a kid and I first heard the words Underground Railroad, I imagined black people on trains underground. I mean, I think even imagine is the wrong word. Uh, my grandfather was a longshoreman and I would see him put on his hard hat and his steel toe boots and go to work. And so when I heard the words Underground Railroad, I just saw men like him uh, building these tunnels and these trains underground. And uh, I was familiar with Coulson uh, ever since his first novel, The Intuitionist, which builds this Jedi-like world, you know, out of elevator inspectors in a fictional New York City. And so when I heard he had written a book where the conceit of the Underground Railroad was that it was an actual network of trains underground, right away I thought, oh, I just have to, uh, I have to get a hold of this. And so, yeah, I read the book before Moonlight even premiered uh, at Telluride, like right around the same time, a few weeks before we premiered, I sent Colson a link and uh, he loved the film and we were off, off to the races. So uh, the idea of working in long form for you, Barry, is this, um, I guess I'm curious, was it more exciting or scary to, cause I mean, you're here, you are coming off of Moonlight, which was one of, you've said three things that you really wanted to do. you tell your own sort of story of your, where you came from, then Beale Street, you know, adapt James Baldwin. And then this was going to be the third of the kind of goals, but to do it in a long form where it's, mm -hmm. is, is it like making 10 separate feature films or is it, can you describe it in a different, you know, what is it like? No, it wasn't like making 10 separate feature films. We definitely wanted to make a TV show. You know, we yeah. wanted it to be episodic, especially because the book itself is episodic in nature, but we didn't want to bend the, the format of television to our whims. You know, we wanted to lean into the idea of creating a television show. Um, I had staff in the writer's room of The Leftovers, season two with Damon Lindelof. Got to see how he worked. And it, it didn't seem like it was going to be uh, daunting because I was going to approach it the way I'd seen uh, Damon approach the making of that show. Um, what I didn't expect was I thought we would have to plan out every single thing. You know, it's 116 days. We'd have to prep and know exactly what we're doing every single day. Once we got into the process, I realized it was actually more interesting to have it be more elastic. And so, you know, both myself and James and then watching Tuso become the character, we realized in the field, like around day 25, oh, we can actually create new story based on what's happening in front of the camera. And once we realized that, the whole thing just kind of opened up. In hindsight, is there any way it ever could have been a feature film? It seems like it would be pretty crazy. Absolutely. I think absolutely, for me at least, I think in order to make the show the way that we wanted to make it, you know, where the, the hard images or the dark images um, could have a certain veracity, but then also have the light images have the same kind of veracity as well and to earn them over the course of course evolution. I, I don't think that would have been possible um, in a feature film. To me, in order to do the things that we were attempting to do, it had to be a television show. So Joy and James, obviously you guys have great history with Barry uh, too. So I think internationally, this is your your first kind of big coming out. And I, I know though that in South Africa, uh, you really made a, a name for yourself there. And I guess I just wonder for people who are now curious to know everything about you, can you tell us a little bit about your journey to this project and then also how you heard that this 
this particular project was uh, out there even? Oh, um, I don't know. Um, I think I started my professional career in 2014 after having studied in university. Um, I did drama in university and then I'd given myself about six years to work in South Africa, save up and make my way to America and see, you know, what would come of it. And so at top of 2019, I was able to save up enough money to be here for about two and a half months. Um, I'd auditioned for the Underground Railroad in November 2018, but I didn't think anything of it. I didn't think, you know, because I, I, I got the brief. I was in New York for the International Emmys. I My mind was telling me, you don't even have the accent. You don't know what's happening. It's your first U.S. audition. Do it, you know, do your best, but with the hopes that you would be in the archives for future projects, not necessarily for this one. And so when I came at the top of 2019, I was taking a bunch of meetings with studio executives and casting directors, and I was able to get into a work session with Francine Maisler, who is the, the casting director for the show. Um, we played with the material. It was a lot of fun. And again, for me, it was about learning, doing my best and just having fun with it. And then that evening, we, I was told that it's a uh, callback and that um, Barry would like to meet me the next day. Had a me I had the meeting with Barry, very chill, nothing hectic, just like a conversation about anything and everything. He was a super cool person. And again, it's like, you know, people are going, oh, it's Barry Jenkins. And I'm just like, I'm here to learn. I'm here to grow. I'm here, you know, to make the most of the opportunity. And then eventually, you know, in that conversation with Barry, I heard that the show is based on a book. And so in the, t like the two weeks between meeting Barry and the test shoot, I read the book like twice, you know, in preparation for the final test shoot. And in the work session itself with Barry, good lordy, he worked me, he worked me, he stretched me, we did the scenes over and over and over and over again to the point where, uh, again, my contact lens flipped in on itself and I was just like, I hope <laughs> they don't want anything more from me. <laughs> but yeah, um, that's, I think, the shortened version of my story to the underground Railroad. <laughs> Well, thank you. And and Barry, can I ask? I'm sure, you know, a ton of people wanted this part. How what what, what was it about too so that uh made you decide she was the woman for the job? Uh, part of it was when her contact flipped over. She kept <laughs> going with it. I knew she had an inner strength. <laughs> A little bit of trivia. That was while Bill Street was in release. So Stefan James actually was the, the scene partner um, ah. for, for that callback. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it came down to Tuso and another young woman um, who's going to be a major star uh, uh, very soon. And um, I knew that the show, one at the beginning of the series, the character can't really express herself through voice. It's got to be through eye contact, through posture. And there were just certain things that Tuso did and is working and reworking uh, and the callback that made it very clear she could communicate that way but also too she understood the character and it's 116 days scott and 116 days not of doing a half a page this day two pages that day of like six seven pages of really dense material every day um and uh, i just felt that she had the inner strength um to get through uh, the journey but also too to be able to calibrate from this scene to that where the character needed to, needed to go next um, and just a, a follow up about the wonderful ensemble that you surrounded her with. Um, we people will in, in the States certainly know Joel Edgerton and Lily Rabe and a handful of folks, Will Poulter. Um, the per I, I'd love anything you want to say about them, but also I was, I think the, the performer who haunts me the most is actually 11 year old Chase Dillon, who is just has such a screen presence. And uh, I just wonder where you know, anything you can share about him as well. Yeah, it was the same thing. Uh, we actually, I, I'm pretty sure Tuso's callback was the same day. It was, it was. Um, uh, you know, when, when we cast these parts, it's a, it's a meritocracy. I mean, you can be, I don't care where you are or who you are. If you show me that you were the character, then you were the character. And uh, Chase's tape came in and, you know, he looks like this, because uh, he was he was nine when he auditioned and he was 10 when we filmed. So you like this nine-year-old, nine going on 91. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Chase Dillon. And, uh, and it was really cool. I'm glad you mentioned Joel because when you're working with a child actor, the scene partner with that child is helping you 
um, is helping you guide them. And I think the fact that Joel is also a director really helped um, in that case. But Chase was awesome. I mean, you know, talking about Chase and Tuso, I was actually mad at her because, you know, I would look up on social media and on the weekends, they'd be like hanging out bowling and playing catch <laughs> her, her, Joel and Chase. And, uh, and I realize now that was a way of demystifying the process for him uh, and getting him comfortable. Um, and it was really wonderful watching James and, and everyone else kind of adjust the process you know, so that we could put Chase in positions to be the best Homer that he could be. I mean, Scott, I, that character is, man, that was brutal. Mm. I wanted to punch Colson in the face many times for forcing us to deal with that character. But, um, but yeah, I think Chase did a great job with him. Great job. Yeah. Um, I, I am about to come to you, James and Joy, please forgive me. I just have one more setup question before we do that. <laughs> Always great to listen to. So I, I've got to ask, Love it. This this directed to both Barry and to so when you're doing a, a feature film, I understand it's very rarely shot in sequence. But how how does it work now when you're doing a limited series of this length and you're jumping between time periods and locations? Are you able to even within an episode do things in sequence or or just how does that work? No, we couldn't. And you know, I was thinking about this. I used to think that this was a limitation, James, but I think it actually was a was a blessing because I think that because we because it's a road show, you know, we would have locations. We would try to amortize locations. So I think the order we shot in was South Carolina, Georgia, Mabel, uh, the two Indianas, then North Carolina, then all the Tennessee work. And we also did everything underground um, at the beginning, all the stuff with the trains and the tunnels. Uh, what was really beautiful about that was there was only so much out of sequence sequence we could film because we didn't have access to all the actors. So typically any actor who comes through a set, you film all of their work. I think because we didn't have that luxury, we could build, we could discover things and then build it into the narrative later. So there's a great scene between uh, Joel and Megan Boone. Megan Boone's an old friend of uh, James and me, James and Joy. She went to college with us and uh, she did a great, great job in the show. She has this wonderful scene with Joel but in that scene, they're standing uh, in, the, in the dorm, Joel finds Cora's uh, okra seeds. And it was the first episode we shot. And the importance of the okra grew as we made the show. And I realized, oh shit, I've got to cut that scene. It's such great work, but I got to cut that scene because he got to the seeds too, too early. And so I think because of that, it was actually really cool. So we shot the episodes, um, not in sequence, but we do a whole episode out of sequence, just, you know, if, the, if James wanted the light to be a certain way or whatnot, but then we'd have to wait to get to the next state. And that created this really beautiful thing where as a showrunner, we could discover things in one state and whether that state came before or after in the order of the show, we would go in and, you know, reconfigure. It was really awesome. And too, so is that, I mean, I again, I, I recognize that most projects are done out of sequence, but when you're talking about this large of a canvas for, and you're in all of it, uh, how do you do you have to kind of um, kind of chart things out or something to remember exactly like how do you I just I can't imagine. A hundred percent. I've never done a feature film before, so I've never shot in sequence before. Um, I've always done episodic dramas. And so it really is about a case for me whereby because you have the advanced schedule and you have an idea of how are you going to shoot. So in my preparation, I sit with the with the scripts, I sit with the scenes that we would shoot. And um, I write down like everything, like every like life-changing moment or events that happened to Cora in summary form. So that let's say we're shooting episode eight, I would have everything from episode one up until episode eight that happened to her that would have shifted her mentally, emotionally, physically, um, and then the scene. So I'm going, but 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 just reading the summary, I understand what it is that I'm getting into as I step into this moment. But then even being on set, Barry would do that where he would be a reminder of where it, where it is that she has come from as we step into this next moment. Yeah, yeah, Scott, Scott, I want to call something out real quick because the uh, the the end of the first Indiana episode where yeah. Cora and Caesar were doing the dance, we had to film that very early because that 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 location, that set was a part of where all yeah. the trains were. So we had to film that maybe like day 18. And I didn't realize how emotional it was gonna be. I like I just I just dashed it off on the weekend that we came in because James and I were yeah. like, we're do something with this platter. So we do the scene and 
Aaron and Tusa were just bawling. And I'm like, man, that was, that was really good. <laughs> and then later when we were in Tennessee and, uh, and Ridgeway's giving his speech, I was like, how, how do we provoke Quora? How do I provoke Tuso, unfortunately? And that was where the line plucked those blue eyes right out of his head. It just popped, it just popped into my head. And I think if we didn't do it in that order, because that scene was an outlier, her and Caesar yeah. uh, danced, we should have filmed that after Tennessee, but because we filmed it before, I was like, oh, that's how I do it. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, mama. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's, it's the work could, that happens, but yeah. Because there are moments where, you know, um, I, it was like it's the, the, the one scene where Cora sees the in, uh, the Tennessee Indiana station for the, for the first time where Royal and them bring her in. When I watched it physically, I was like, it's not where I would have uh, wanted to be had we shot it off. Yeah, I would have been completely different, but because we shot it so early, but people don't have to know. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I want to divulge another um, secret of yours, your guys, that I think it was really creative. And I, it's out there. It's not really a secret because it was, I know it's been discussed, but James, you guys essentially, I mean, Cora's going through, I think, five states during her journey but you guys shot almost exclusively if not exclusively in georgia right so you have to figure out how do you visually differentiate between these states and james i think you came up with some very creative ways of of doing that right within the camera i hope so yeah. um, <laughs> i hope that's true yeah, I don't know. You know, I think it's, you know, like anything that Barry and I and, and I, we all do together, we try to make creative choices that reflect the characters that we're telling a story about. So Cora's on a journey, so therefore the camera needs to be as well. Um, you know, the way we did it in multiple ways, but for, for camera wise specifically, we created different sort of color palettes, what we call LUTs in, in the camera, which is a technical term. But, you know, it's a, it's a way to sort of differentiate how colors interact with our cameras technically. So there's certain colors in, in Indiana autumn that are emphasized in a certain way that's different from South Carolina, let's say. And all that's an effort, of course, just to sort of be, be tied into the narrative journey that Cora's on, of course. Um, but yeah, it was all, all across the board. I remember for, I think for our Tennessee episode, we must've bought all the black mulch in the, his, in, in, in the entire country probably to cover up that red Georgia earth, for example. So, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't just me. It was biodegradable, biodegradable, biodegradable. Biodegradable, that's true. That's true. No, it, it, it did just fine naturally as well. But, but, you know, the whole, the whole sort of process of our department, costume department and everyone involved, you know, Took a took a choice throughout the the, the the narrative structure to make sure that we were sort of reflecting course journey for sure. And I think I think two things, something that we haven't mentioned. You you and Mark Freeberg actually scouted. I mean, we filmed entirely in the state of Georgia, but James and Mark Freeberg, our production designer, they flew all over upstate New York, um, all, all over um, uh, Ohio as well. Yeah, Ohio. Yeah, like many yeah. different places. Wow. Yeah, and that was obviously just to sort of like, you know, what while we didn't end up shooting the show there, but it, it massively informed all kinds of creative choices that we then applied to Georgia. So, you know, going on those trips early on to sort of talk about wh where Cora in, in the story might end up uh, end up going, you know, we took a lot of that experience and applied it to sort of some, some, some you know, more specific choices in, in the state of Georgia, of course. Well, also, I want to say, as in all of Barry's prior projects, which you guys have worked together on, there are just some breathtaking uh, shots. And I mean, there's, I'm thinking about the, uh, as the, as the um, village is burning and, and the young girl, uh, I believe Grace is fleeing and your camera pulls up and you see the, right, the whole community and, and stuff like that. I mean, there are just some that, that have really stuck with me. And I wonder for you, what was the kind of one where you felt you were biting off the, most and are happiest with kind of how it came out are, are there are some there are some big uh swings here I, it seems to me yeah you know I, <laughs> um i think we we there's some big emotional swings yeah. and so i think we we try to hit as hard as the story needs us to hit i think that's something we're just trying to sort of be reflective in um you know sure there's some there's some creative ones or technical ones rather that are challenging that i'm sure no one really cares to hear about but for, for me emotionally I would say one, one thing I'm the most excited about and happy with was 
in um, in the scene just after the corn shucking scene where the Claire de Lune song is playing. You know, that was a that was a scene that I just I would just I still remember shooting it today and how emotionally uh, that resonated with uh, with me filming it. And I think you know hopefully hopefully the the, the sort of I don't know, the emotions are a big spectrum in that scene, but they hopefully resonate on, on camera as much as they did off camera. Well, and I, I know you've also spoken about the Valentine Farm mm. uh, scenes where um, that you, 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 I think in terms of pacing and things uh, approach that, I'm sure I know with, that would be involved, a, a discussion probably with Barry, but just uh, like what, talk about why were those, uh, you know, why that, why that kind of, um, really stood out as, as you've looked, you know, when, when you were doing this about how you wanted to be very deliberate about the way you shot Valentine Farm. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, uh, how long do we have? Um, you know, I think, I think, uh, I think that portion of the show is a culmination of, of the journey. And so there's a lot packed into that, those, those two episodes that, you know, what we were trying to be sensitive to and reference and, and touch upon visually, because uh, it's all in there. There's there's the, the violent aspects of things that happen in Indian Winter, but there's also the romance as well. There's the idea of community, which is a massive topic within the story as well. So, you know, I, I it's hard to, I mean, you know, I'd have to get into it for quite a while to touch on each of those, but I think for us, it was about sort of, I can think about those big sweeping cameras in the opening of, of Indiana Autumn, for example, and that thing was for, uh, you know, for many reasons to touch on the communal aspect of those episodes. Um, but I can think about those scenes between Cora and Royal as well and being as intimate as, as possible because it just felt like that that relationship was so emotionally, there's a real huge bond between those, those, those characters and those people. Um, so I think, I just think it, it was the culmination of all the things we've just gone through in the last series of episodes kind of coming to, to, to feel as, as, as strongly as we possibly could. Yeah. Um, Joy, I was curious, are you, sometimes I know people will be um, editing during the shoot itself. Sometimes it all comes, I guess, at the end where, how does it work with you and Barry or, or was this a, uh, like, are you, are you um, present throughout the whole shoot? Uh, well, yeah, I was editing back in LA while they were shooting in Atlanta. Um, and I did get the chance to come down for about two to three weeks to check out the set and um, work on episode or well, chapter one with Barry for a little bit. So that was the thing that was a little tricky about doing 10 episodes is like Barry had to think about post-production while in production. And that's not his favorite thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess the, the upside of a, uh, of a limited series in terms of just one of the upsides is that you can actually really let things breathe. I, I think probably more and indulge in silences or, you know, just all of that. And I think you guys really, um, make the the most of that and i guess was there a discussion uh just because it is such different pacing it seems than a feature film did you guys at the beginning sit down and say look we want to make sure that we are leaving that room in each episode to 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 have that the, just the, to arrive at the pacing that you ended up with here yeah, I think one of the, the great things about knowing Barry and James for so long is I feel like oftentimes when I get the footage, I can see what their intent is. And so one of the things that we had, I would say the luxury of doing is allowing what we were able to capture inform us on how tonally the episodes were gonna shape out. And so one of the things that I think was great was that originally Tennessee was one long episode um, and having the ability to break that up into two episodes, I think was, you know, gave us I would say the um, we were basically handed the tools to allow that first episode, Tennessee um, Exodus, really breathe. So when you're there with you know Cora and Jasper, it feels like this has been a long journey and this like apocalyptic you know area of Tennessee. And I think the punctuation of losing Jasper at the end really affects the audience as opposed to if we were trying to fit that in to one long episode, I don't think it would have been as impactful um, as it ended up being. And was it always the plan that you, you know, you guys have one episode that's like 20 minutes and then you have others that are over an hour. Was, is it just 
was that sort of all mapped out before you started shooting Barry or was that something that you found in the editing room? No, that, that was mapped out. We knew that uh, the Fanny Briggs episode would be the shortest. There was another episode called Genesis that was going to be just as short um, that we wrote and scouted for. We just didn't have the, didn't have the budget uh, to film. So no, I, I, I knew that there was going to be this wave that the audience was, was riding and that the Fanny Briggs chapter was going to be a little bit of like an aperitif um, just to sort of like, as James said, because when you get to Indiana, so much of the tone and the, and the language shifts. And it was nice to give people just a little bit of a, you know, that, that course between courses um, to make sure that the palate was cleansed. So yeah, that was intentional. Uh, Joy, there's these moments, I think, I think it's in every episode. I'm, I'm, I, I'm sort of doubting myself, but where you have uh, a, almost like a portrait at some point of people either looking at the camera or just off the side of the camera. But like, was that a also a, a pre-planned thing or this thing that I, I guess it was obviously was it was you guys shot them so it had to be but but I mean what what's talk about the intent of of those moments if you if you would well it's one of those things where you know if you look back in um if Field Street could talk I remember when we were first getting this footage of them looking in the camera and being like oh, I know there's going to be a place for this but we haven't arrived there and that's one of the things that um, we allow the film or, you know, the series to speak to us and every single one of those portraits, you know, found a home um, and basically was informing us and, and allowing us to see um, these characters fully formed. And, you know, one of the ones that really, you know, I said to Barry, I'm like, it gets me every single time is um, in Indiana winter. It's just, you know, right after that shucking scene, and it's kind of like the calm before the storm, but just giving them that space, um, you know, for allowing the audience to really identify with these characters before we go to, you know, the second half of the show, I think really, really kind of, I think, emphasize the point that we were trying to make with the series is that see these people, see where we come from and identify with, you know, their circumstances. So I guess, Barry, you've, you've said that this, in some ways, and this is a quote I'd seen, the hardest undertaking I've ever attempted in my creative life, close quote, particularly, I guess, we, uh, quote, the need to tell the truth without being devoured by the barbarity of that truth, close quote. Um, for all of, I mean, for anyone, I, for, for people working on this, for viewers, this is um, emotionally, it's got to be a, a meat grinder, you know, just to be and to be there for 116 days doing this. And I, I know that you guys took, made great efforts to be as um, kind of uh, there for everybody as possible. I read about a therapist being on set and all of that, but I guess at the end of the day for you, um, Barry and, and Tusa, you're there every day. Um, was it, what was that like for you? And were you able, is there a way when you're dealing with such heavy stuff to then in the way that sometimes I think people sometimes turn off the switch and when between setups or whatever, and they can kind of let loose. I mean, was that possible with, with a, a project like this? Um, for, for, I don't know that it was possible. Um, it wasn't a meat grinder. I mean, I mean, Tuso has been posting all these videos of, uh, of her uh, cutting up on set. I mean, we had, we had some fun. We kind of we had to, you know, we kind of had to, or just say laugh to keep from crying. Um, I think the thing for myself and James especially was, you know, it had to be good. I mean, it had to be fucking great. It had to be. And so there's no room to, you know, and the margins are very thin. You're doing too many pages every day for too many consecutive days. And yet it's got to be great. It's got to be undeniable. And so there's no space to allow yourself to wallow um, in the emotional burden because you got to figure out every day there's going to be one of these scenes and we've got to figure out the best way to shoot it every single day. Um, and maybe I guess in a way, because that, that constant responsibility, that constant pressure was there and it had to be met every single day. I mean, there kind of wasn't, there wasn't room for me at least to be devoured by the material. Now I will say our therapist, uh, guidance counselor, Kim White, 
pulled me off set around, I was like day 33, day 34. You know, she pulled me off set and was like, yeah, you're, you're not gonna be able to make it, you know, all this way without processing some of this stuff. Um, and, and I think, I'm sure other people had similar experiences either with Miss Kim or with other cast or crew members. Um, but as there was the responsibility to get the art itself right was too great. And then the responsibility to get the themes and the subject matter right was equally as great. So that's why I, I don't know how any of us got through it, but I do know that working together was like the only way that we could all get through it. Yeah. Tusa, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, uh, I, I share the same thoughts. Uh, for me, it was really important to be able to differentiate between the story we're telling and who I am, just emotionally, mentally, physically at all times. I had to be aware um, when I was not within the world, I had to like separate myself as much as I could. Hence, you know, the get togethers, you know, the games nights and all that jazz. But again, on set, I never felt like I was alone. Um, Kim Wright would constantly check in on me, um, even if I, I didn't reach out to her, you know, cost and crew were, were of great support. And even now, just this little I had a little moment right now where I started crying because I've been on a panel with Barry and Joy, but this is the first time being on a panel with James. And as he was talking, I actually, it took me back to being on set and it reminded me of how much of a great support he was to me. <sighs> but yeah, um, a lot of people came through. <laughs> Your fault, James. <laughs> Turn this camera off, James. You're going to make me cry, too, so come on. Oh. <laughs> but you know, but Scott, but again, I, I think is it was, we were all just in there. I mean, we were just in there. It's like the world just, it's, it's funny. I feel like I've been out of the world for like three years because making this thing, we were just like in this thing together. It was really important. We were in this thing together. And then we were all home uh, alone you know, except for those of us who were still somehow in this thing, trying to form it and shape it. And, 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 to, and, to, and to be honest, to both honor our ancestors, but also honor the commitment we had all made to this thing. I mean, it was so intense, Scott. I mean, it was, it was I, intense. I can't imagine. I can imagine. And I guess I, I just want to ask you one more thing, Barry, and then I'll, I'll leave you guys. Uh, I, I, I wonder in your view, what is the best way to consume this mm. great work that you've done? Is it watching one a night? Is it binging half and then the night, you know, do you have any thoughts on that? And then also what you hope, obviously you guys poured your heart and soul into this. Mm. Um, what is it that in a perfect world, a viewer leaves this experience of watching this thinking or doing differently than before? Yeah, I'll answer the second part first. It's the same thing with, with all the things that, that, especially the three of us that we've made together. You know, I hope that the person starts the show and maybe they, they assume there's a distance between or remove between them and the main character. And in going through the journey, they can really see inside this character and understand how this character came to be, why the character is making the choices they're making and what the world is doing to either limit or, or combat or embolden those choices. Because I think in that part and understanding how the world around that character is shaping them, is informing them, is limiting them, then we can see in our own lives how the world is limiting us and what we're participating in that's limiting others. That's my always my hope for anything that we make. With this one in particular, you know, my hope was to recontextualize the way we view my ancestors. You know, we, we use this word enslaved, which refers to what was done to them and not to who they were or what they did. And I think the journey of Korra is this wonderful example, especially in you know, all our interactions with all the characters, but especially with the character Grace and the character Mabel. Again, who she was, what she did, you know, who her ancestors were, her immediate ancestors were and what they did. That's my hope, just yeah. to see these folks. How people watch it, I think that depends on the viewer, man. That depends. I will say, having made the show, I wouldn't watch 10 straight hours of this. <laughs> but, but, look, but it's the same thing. When I read a novel, I'm not going to sit down and read. If I was reading the book, The Underground Railroad, I wouldn't read it over the course of one sitting. I maybe read it over two or three weeks. Right. You know? And I will say there was talk about, oh, one a week or maybe release them in chunks and this and that. You know, I, I do think that the, the first episode 
um, is, uh, is, is very, very fact-based. It's a very fact-based experience of what the world of these characters would have been like. I think to have watched that episode and then for a week not understand that the world the show was building is bigger than just that place, that might have been difficult for some people. Um, and so that's all I'll say about that. Joy uh, James, what y'all think? How should people watch the show? <laughs> I think you. I think you said that, said it right. That it's going to be unique to each individual. You know, I think that people need to take the chunk, the bite they can chew on for a while, and that's just going to be a really personal thing. That's my guess, anyway. That's how I feel about it. Yeah, I think it's very similar to how we um, eat. You know, not everyone eats exactly the same, and so basically, you know, the portion control is in the hands of the viewer. Some people want to see three episodes a day. Some people only want to see a half episode a day. It's up to them. Um, and I think as filmmakers, we can't dictate how you watch it. And I think having the freedom of being able to take it in at your own pace is one of the things that's really cool about, you know, being up on a streamer. So. Yeah. Can, I, can I say one last thing about that? Because I, I would just say what's really cool about being a series on Amazon is that, you know, even if people aren't ready for right now, yeah. they can watch it eight months from now, a year from now, it's like, it might not be, they might not be ready in this very, very moment. So that's right. kind of great as well. Well, there's so many uh, great things that we could continue talking about. Nick Bertel's score and all of that. And I, you know, unfortunately we're out of time, but I just want to thank each of you for the great work and for taking the time to do this and uh, good luck with the rest of the, the rollout. I, I, I appreciate your time. Thanks. Thank you very much, man. Appreciate you. Yeah. Uh, what, what's all them books and DVDs in there, bro? Like you, like you, <laughs> like you took down a couple of blockbusters, man. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, we, uh, it was uh, you. Got me through the got me through the <laughs> pandemic. <laughs> Stop taking everything out the back of blockbuster before they shut down. <laughs>